You all know them, you've all seen them, and maybe even stumbled across them. The little golden plates that can be found in many European cities. They blend in so well with the city's life that you often don't even notice them anymore. That's a shame, because behind every shiny stone lies a story. What I'm referring to are, of course, stumbling stones. 10 centimeter concrete cubes with a breastplate on which the names and dates of life of victims of Nazi and fascist persecutions are engraved. They are intended to commemorate the people at the last place where they lived or worked before falling victims to Nazi fascist terror. Today, stumbling stones are being placed for Jews, Sinti and Roma, political or religious resistance members, victims of the euthanasia murders, homosexuals, Jehovah Witnesses, and those persecuted as what the Nazis called a social. By now, it is the largest decentralized memorial worldwide for the victims of the Holocaust, with over 120,000 stones in over 1,800 cities across 31 countries. The first stumbling stone was laid in 1992, and the whole idea for this initiative goes back to the artist Gunther Demning. He got inspired by the Talmud statement, a person is only forgotten when their name is forgotten. The aim of this initiative is therefore really to embed remembrance into everyday lives of today's citizens. And Demning has stated that, unlike central memorial places, stumbling stones represent a deeper intrusion of memory in everyday life. So the power of the stumbling stones really lies in the encounter between today and yesterday, between observer and victim. It is really about causing a mental stumble, that makes the fate of the victims of the Holocaust is tangible and accessible for everyone. Indeed, as a high school student visiting one of the installations of the stone set, you don't fall over the stumbling stones, you stumble with your head and with your heart. In this podcast, we aim to investigate the role of the stumbling stones in different cities and how this project is used locally to foster remembrance of the Holocaust and its victims. We want to shed light on the diversity of the projects in different cities. Despite the common idea, each city has a different way of implementing the stumbling stones, as local stakeholders negotiate the place of this type of commemoration in specific contexts. The difference between the cities are partly due to historical circumstances and partly due to the choices that local communities make. We are four students who decided to study the importance of remembrance in our communities. In total, we are producing four podcast episodes each focused on a local community that has integrated this project into its streets. We will discuss the cases of Maastricht in the Netherlands, Düsseldorf and Munich in Germany, and Venice in Italy. To understand the meaning behind the initiative itself, and in particular its meaning for these cities and local communities, we had the honor of talking with the wonderful people that dedicated their lives to the Stumbling Stones initiative. And, although each of those stories will offer unique perspective, they all have one thing in common. They all emphasize the incredible importance of remembrance in our everyday lives. This podcast is produced for the Honors Project 2024 of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences of Maastricht University. We are Leonie, Laura, Fien and Cecilia. Our supervisor is Professor Nico Randerat. Special thanks to all the people that offered their time to make this project possible. And thank you for listening. One November night, Hedwig Markus sat in the office of the café Garema that belonged to her and her husband Paul Markus. The café was spacious, with wood paneling and plank flooring leading through multiple rooms, above which still life and portrait paintings created a comfortable atmosphere. Newspapers could be fetched from a stand in one room, a counter lined the next, and light flooded the third. One of the café's advertisement praised the service and atmosphere, as well as the modest prices. Hedwig Marcus was waiting for her husband to return, who had gone out to post a letter. The street outside was empty and dead silent. Soon enough he came back, and the two sat in their office together. About ten minutes later, one of the employees, Leo Abraham, burst into their office. Nazi gangs had breached the café, he reported, as stones flew through the windows into the building. The three sought refuge from the violent projectiles behind the furniture as men in uniforms pushed into the office. Mr. Marcos unlocked a less-used door to the house's staircase to fetch the police. 
His wife followed him onto the street, where a crowd had gathered, jeering and throwing stones. While her husband could escape, Mrs. Marcus was violently attacked by the crowd, who beat her with everything they had at hand. Trying to escape the beating, she fled back into the house, where the beating continued, and she fell unconscious. This podcast not only tells the story of Hedwig and Paul Marcus during one of the most horrific times in the history of Düsseldorf, national socialist rule, it also tells the story of a project to remember their names and their story along those of thousands of other victims of Nazi prosecution and murder. Today, a concrete block is embedded at the old address of the family Marcus in Düsseldorf. A small brass plate at the face of the block, about 10 centimeters in size that sits flush with the sidewalk, reminds us of Mr. Marcus and his and his family's story. This so-called stumbling stone, or Stolperstein in German, is a physical connection to history and part of a greater infrastructure of remembrance. But why does it exist? And who put it there? After the Second World War, as Europe and Germany specifically attempted to grasp the aftermath of the tragedy, ideas like never again led people to turn to remembrance as a tool to prevent conflict and genocide in the future. Eyewitness accounts, like the one from Mrs. Marcus, are one way of remembering the horrors that the Nazi rule meant for so many people. But given that the year 2024 marks the 80th anniversary of the D-Day, the beginning of the military operation that ended Nazi occupation in Germany, less and less eyewitnesses survive. This begs the question, how will we remember those that were killed in the future? How do we keep alive the memories of people who have long passed? These questions have been answered by countless people in countless ways. Archives like that of Yad Vashem and countless others around the world collect and preserve the paper trails with which the Nazi government documented the deportation and murder of millions of Jews across Europe. Architectural installations like the Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe, also known as Holocaust Mahnmal in Berlin, give space to remember the terror. And sites of former concentration camps aim to give visitors some sense of the unspeakable horror that happened there. In the late 90s, Cologne-based artist Gunther Demning had a different idea. He wanted to bring the names of the victims into everyday life to make their names, and by extent them, unforgettable. To achieve this, he embedded stones into the sidewalk at the last address where a victim had lived or worked before being deported and murdered. In 2002, After the artist had begun getting city approval for his project, the Stolpersteiner picked up their pace, with stones being placed all over Germany, starting in Hamburg. Today, more than 30,000 stumbling stones have been placed in Germany alone, with over 100,000 all over Europe. In Düsseldorf, the first of now over 300 stones was placed in 2003, until recently, Gunther Demning placed every stone in Germany himself. To admonish and commemorate victims of Nazi prosecution, a memorial center was set up in 1986 by the city of Düsseldorf. Accompanying the city project was an association of supporters of the memorial center that supports the work of the center. For example, it publishes a lot of the books that went into this podcast. In 2003, the supporters of the Düsseldorf Memorial Center started a steering project for facilitating, planning and executing the project Stolpersteine in Düsseldorf. Because the Stolpersteine, in most cases, are placed on public property and become the property of the respective cities that they are placed in, setting a Stolperstein can initially be a bureaucratic process involving the city and other stakeholders. As remembrance is at the core of the Stolperstein idea, lots of historical research goes into each case as local initiatives collect documents and accounts to write a biography for the victim for whom the stone is placed. In Düsseldorf, trained historians from the supporters of the Memorial Center help with this research, as well as with coordinating the placement with the city. Representative of the communities of different groups of victims were included in setting up the project. One group, representing the Sinti and Roma, did not want their victims to be remembered by name due to their ethical codex. 
So their wishes were respected. Producing the Stolpersteine costs money. So does the travel and administration behind the project. As of 2024, producing and setting a Stolperstein in Germany costs 120 euros. This does not include the hours of labor that is put into the organization and research that goes into each stone. They can be commissioned by individuals like family members of a victim or organizations. Really, anyone can sponsor a Stolperstein. The project was not always met with enthusiasm, though. In 2003, the Christian Democratic Party and right-wing populist party spoke out against the placement of stumbling stones in Bergedorf, a part of Hamburg. They argued that the confrontation with the Third Reich must take place at the site of the horror, and that people working over the stones would trample over the dignity of these victims. One newspaper reported that their reasoning was that Günther Demning was using the project for his own profit. In 2014, a lawyer in Cologne turned to the district court to remove the stumbling stones in front of his house. According to a local tabloid, he said, The children talk about a murder house, but my house is not a place of horror. Since the stones are placed on public property with full support of the city, the stones stayed where they were. Support for the stones was wide in Düsseldorf, and there were solid infrastructures like the Mann and Gedenkstätte that could facilitate the setting of stones with professional historical expertise. This led to a good documentation of the biographies of the victims who got a stone, in a lot of cases. The population of Jews sank from 50,503 in 1933 to 1,813, just six years later. Today, under 400 victims have a stumbling stone, among them Paul Marcus. In the morning, Hedwig Marcus woke up in her cafe. It had been trashed by the Nazis who invaded it. Her employees tended to her injuries and brought her to the Jewish doctor Löwenberg. The doctor took her in and Mr. Marcus, who had fled to his brother, joined her. His attempts to get help from the police had been futile, they simply ignored him. Later, people in uniforms breached the doctor's office and smashed windows and doors before leaving again. That night, three men in black uniforms entered the office and shouted, hands up, as they opened fire on the defenseless patients. Mr. Marcus was killed instantly. Mrs. Marcus was shot in the stomach, but survived. Dr. Löwenberg was eventually able to get her into a hospital where she received the medical attention that she needed. Later, she was able to escape Nazi prosecution with her son by leaving Europe. We know of these events of the 10th of November 1938 because when she visited Düsseldorf again, decades later, Hedwig Marcus gave a detailed account of the night. This night, Coordinated action took place across Germany against Jewish businesses, Jews, and other groups prosecuted by the National Socialists, now known as the November Pogrome of 1938. Stormtroopers of SA and SS, two organizations infamous for their role in the Holocaust, together with other Nazi henchmen, killed hundreds of people and arrested thousands that would end up in work in concentration camps. The November Pogrome were amongst the first open outbreaks of violence after years of deteriorating living conditions for Jews in the country. It is widely considered as the beginning of the systematic mass murder of Jews, members of the opposition parties and other groups. Previous action against Jews had been less deadly, like the so-called Polen Aktion in October of the same year. Over 350 Polish Jews were arrested and jailed that night, before being transported to the Polish border. Very few of those expelled from the Düsseldorf region would survive the war. The extension of horrible history into the present can be painful. Doing this research into not only the Stolperstein project, but the history of Nazi terror in Düsseldorf made me see the city differently. The Staatspolizeistelle Düsseldorf, for example, was one of the biggest in Germany after the one in Berlin and was responsible for one of the most populated areas in Germany. Here, the deportation of Jews and other victims of Nazi prosecution often originated. Trains would start at the cargo train station in Düsseldorf-Derendorf 
and pick up other wagons in nearby cities like Wuppertal, Essen and Dortmund on their way to various ghettos and camps, like the Emsland camps, a series of concentration camps in the north of Germany close to the Dutch border. Realizing that places that are familiar to me now had been sites of terrible events only about 100 years ago gave me a new appreciation of the comparative peace and freedom I enjoy. Because many of the Nazi crimes are well documented, be it by the state apparatus itself, through official documents or propaganda newspapers, or by witnesses, I was able to find a lot of information at my local library, as well as the internet. Many cities have great resources to learn about this aspect of their past, and I can only encourage everyone to seek this knowledge out locally. I believe that history can teach us many things and can help prevent terrible things from repeating themselves. To do that, we need to remember, and as Gunther Dimning said, a person is not forgotten until his or her name is forgotten. This podcast relied heavily on the work of the Mann and Gedenkstätte Düsseldorf, especially works from Dr. Bastian Flehrmann and Hilgard Jacobs, who have contributed significantly to the literature on Düsseldorf before and during the rise of National Socialism, as well as to remembrance projects in Düsseldorf. If you would like to know more about the Stolperstein project of the Third Reich in Düsseldorf, check out the description where we have compiled a reference list for you. This episode is one of a four-part series on how the Stolpersteine entered the streets of four cities across Europe, Düsseldorf, Munich, Maastricht and Venice. We spoke to some of the organizers who made the projects happen and compare how each city remembers its victims. This podcast is a product of the Honors Project 2024 of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Maastricht University. My name is Finn. Thank you for listening. Welcome to this episode where the case of Maastricht will be discussed. To start off, I want to tell you about Familie Hellendaal. For this project, we were able to go to the event where the last Struikelsteine, which is the Dutch word for stumbling stones, were laid in Maastricht. This is where we met Familie Hellendaal and learned about their story. They traveled to Maastricht in memory of six great uncles and great aunts who lived on Wiekersmedestraat during the Second World War and were unjustly arrested and consequently deported. Six struikelstene were laid for them in front of the place they lived, creating a physical connection for remembrance. Learning about their story and talking to the relatives allowed us to experience firsthand the emotional value of this project and of the zones. They represent a sign of respect and monuments for all the victims, offering support for relatives. The Struikelsene project in Maastricht started in 2012 and ended earlier this year, on the 8th of May 2024, due to retirement of the chairman and no one to take over. In total, over 350 stones were placed in Maastricht. These stones are unique memorials and they offer a tangible place for relatives to visit. We had the opportunity to talk with Fred Grunfeld, chairman of the project in Maastricht. He shared details about the process of placing struikelstenen and he shared valuable insights about the challenges of the project. Maastricht, a city nestled near the Belgian border, was one of the first in the Netherlands to fall under German occupation during World War II. Its strategic location made it a prime target for the advancing German army. Despite the oppressive regime and pervasive fear, the spirit of resistance flourished within its streets. By August 1942, the deportation of Jews had begun 
in South Limburg, including Maastricht. Yet, Maastricht witnessed a significantly lower percentage of Jewish deportees compared to the national average. Less than 50% in Maastricht versus 73% nationwide. This lower percentage can be attributed to two primary factors. The city's advantageous geographical position and the courageous efforts of its residents. Maastricht's proximity to the Belgian border provided several escape routes. These routes were lifelines for those seeking to evade capture. But geography alone wasn't enough. The success of these escapes also relied heavily on the bravery and ingenuity of the individual citizens and small groups of aid workers. Despite the compliance of local authorities, particularly the police, opportunities for escape were seized by many, both helpers and those being hunted. Walking through the streets of Maastricht, one might inadvertently stumble upon one of these small plaques, a quiet confrontation with the past. It's a moment of reflection and education, fulfilling one of the primary goals of the Struikelsenen project, to spread awareness and keep the memory of the victims alive. The Struikelsenen serve as a solemn reminder of those who were taken from their homes and lives. Scattered across the Netherlands, over 7,000 Struikelsenen have been placed, with over 350 of them in Maastricht. These stones are unique memorials, focusing on individual victims rather than collective memory. Each stone embedded in the ground in front of the victim's last known residence bears their name, date of birth, date and place of deportation, and date and place of death. The process of placing a Streikelstein is long and labor-intensive. It is not simply about placing a stone in the ground. It requires meticulous research and administration, often taking volunteers four hours a day or even more. Volunteers need to find sources and information on websites where Dutch Jews are registered visit the sites to find the correct location and gather as much historical information as possible about the victims, their lives, activities and situations. This involves researching in German archives as many Jews from other regions came to Maastricht as refugees. Understanding the flow of these refugees and the local authorities' attitudes towards them is crucial. Volunteers also strive to find and contact relatives, write comprehensive biographies and organize ceremonies. These ceremonies include inviting the relatives, filming speeches and uploading videos to websites, ensuring the victims' stories are accessible to all. The Struikelsteine are more than just physical markers. They represent the profound stories of those who once lived in Maastricht. This project relies heavily on volunteers who check and verify names against records from places like Kampesselburg. Sometimes the information available is sparse, leading to superficial biographies. Yet, each stone and its story contribute to the collective memory and ongoing education about this dark chapter in history. During the interview with Fred Grunveld, several interesting aspects about the project in Maastricht were brought to light. Distinguishing 
Maastricht's project from those in other Dutch cities. Unlike Heerle and Kerkrade, the Maastricht project received no public or government funding. Instead, it relied entirely on donations. A testament to the dedication and commitment of the community. Another unique element of this project is its recent conclusion. On May 8, 2024, the last stones were laid, marking the end of this initiative. However, this milestone passed without any media coverage or public attention. A private ceremony was held, attended by relatives and those involved in the project. The rising tide of anti-Semitism in the Netherlands necessitated a low-key approach to avoid protests and violence, a precaution taken after events in other cities experienced unrest. Maastricht's story during World War II is one of resilience, courage and remembrance. The city's unique approach to honoring its past through the Struikelstenen ensures that the individual stories of those lost are not forgotten. Each stone is a testament to the enduring spirit of those who resisted and those who perished. To conclude, we want to thank Fred Grunfeld and Familie Hellendal for sharing their insights and stories with us. And thank you for listening to this episode Venice narrow streets, or Cali, are alive with the sounds of enthusiastic tourists, boisterous children and couples in love. This city, with its unique blend of charm and chaos, offers an experience unlike any other. It is walking aimlessly through Venice that you discover the wonders of the city, finding hidden streets, squares, small bars and restaurants. Among the less known and therefore also quieter areas, there is also Canareggio, an ancient and beautiful district of the city of Venice. This area, less frequented by tourists, holds its own history, often not known by the hundreds of people visiting Venice every day. While walking in Canareggio, small shiny tiles embedded in the ground can be found. These are Stopperstein or Pietre d'Inciampo in Italian, stumbling stones. Each one bears the name of a person along with their birth and death dates. These names belong to Venetians who were deported and perished in Nazi concentration camps during World War II. The Stopperstein project, initiated by artist Gunther Demnig, aims to commemorate victims of the Holocaust in a deeply personal way. Each stone represents a life cut short, a story ended too soon. In Canareggio, the stones are particularly significant. The Sestiere, or district, is home to Venice Jewish Ghetto, one of the oldest in the world. On the night of December the 5th, 1943, 244 Jews were forcibly removed from their homes by the fascist police. They were first taken to Fossoli, a transit camp near Modena, and later deported to extermination camps like Auschwitz. Of those taken, only eight survived. These stones, simply yet profound, serve as a tangible reminder of the lives lost to the horrors of the Nazi regime. Each one tells a story, Take, for example, the stone dedicated to Leo. Leo was just two months old when he was deported and soon after lost his life. His story is one of the many, each equally heartbreaking and significant. Marco Borghi, director of the Venetian Institute for the History of the Resistant and Contemporary Society, shared Leo's history with us, emphasizing the importance of remembering every victim of these atrocities, from the youngest to the eldest. Marco Borghi has explained to us that this project enables to rediscover an urban geography of persecution that before the project was not clear. In general, he told us that this project differentiates itself from other ways of remembering the horrors of the Holocaust because it talks about normal people. Many citizens, when they finance a stone, want to know more about the deported person. 
However, often we don't have a lot of information about them, whether Jewish or political opponents, because they were exactly like us, normal people with normal lives. This kind of memory is much nearer to citizens compared to the more traditional one, as museums or movies, which tends to be very near institutions and high offices of the state. The Stoppestein project is unique in its approach to memory and commemoration. It does not rely on grand monuments or state fundings. Instead, it integrates remembrance into everyday life. These stones, placed outside the former homes of the victims, prompt daily reflection. The crew residents, family who now live where these victims once did, encounter these stones every day. The Superstein project does not return on stratified public memory, but put attention on the singular, to the everyday people. This form of memory is powerful precisely because it is so personal and immediate. It brings history into the present, making it impossible to forget. Venice, with its car-free streets, is particularly suited to this type of memorial. The slow pace of walking allows for contemplation and connection with the past. The sparkle of the Stopperstein in the sunlight catches the eye, inviting passerby to pause and reflect. The Stopperstein project began in 1992, when Gunther Demnig laid the first stone in Cologne, Germany, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Heinrich Himmler Auschwitz decree. The project has since expanded across Europe, with over 75,000 stones installed in more than 1,800 cities and towns. Each Stopperstein is handcrafted by Demning himself, ensuring that every stone is a unique tribute to an individual victim. Demning's inspiration for the Stopperstein project came from a line in the Talmud that states, a person is only forgotten when his or her name is forgotten. By placing these stones in front of the last known residence of the victim, Demning ensures that their names and thus their memories live on. The project name Stopperstein literally means stumbling stones. This concept is intended to cause passerby the metaphorical stumble upon the memory of the victims, prompting reflection and remembrance. The Stopperstein project also highlights the importance of local involvement in the process of remembrance. Community members often participate in the research and installation of the stones, creating a sense of ownership and connection to the past. This grassroots approach ensures that the project resonates deeply with those who live in the neighborhoods where the stones are placed. In Venice, this involvement has fostered a collective commitment to preserving the memory of the Holocaust and educating future generations about its horrors. In Venice, the project has been going on since 2014 and the city deeply recognizes these victims because in those names there could have been anyone's name. In Venice, as in Milan, Rome, Turin and other European cities, this project has allowed a reconciliation between citizens and public places in which everyone passes every day. Thanks to this project, there is a subjective dimension of persecution, which has passed from every single home during the Second World War. The impact of the Stoppestein project extends beyond the individual stones. It has sparked a broader rediscovery of Venice history, particularly the darker chapters that had been forgotten or overlooked. The stones have become a focal point for educational initiatives, guided tours and community discussions. Schools in Venice have incorporated the project into their curricula, encouraging students to research the leaves commemorated by the stones and to engage with their city's history in a meaningful way. Venice's commitment to the Stopperstein project reflects a broader dedication to preserving memory and fostering understanding. The city has embraced the project wholeheartedly, with residents and visitors alike participating in ceremonies to lay new stones. These events are deeply emotional, bringing together survivors, descendants and community members to honour the victims and to pledge to keep their memories alive. As mentioned, community members often participate in the research and installation of the stones, creating a sense of ownership and connection to the past. This grassroots approach ensures that the project resonates deeply with those who live in the neighborhood where the stones are placed. Schools and universities use Topperstein as a starting point for discussion about history, memory and ethics. 
By engaging with these stones, students learn about the impact of the Holocaust on their own communities and the importance of standing against injustice in all of its forms. The project encourages critical thinking and empathy, fostering a generation that is aware of the past and committed to a better future. In addition to the stone, the Stoperstein project has led to the creation also of digital archives and interaction maps. These resources allow people to expose the stories of the victims in greater depth. For instance, it is possible to look up a specific Stoperstein and find detailed information about the individual it commemorates, including photographs, personal letters and testimonies from surviving family members. This digital extension of the project ensures that the memory of this individual is accessible to a global audience. The Stoperstein of Venice are more than just memorials. They are living reminders of the past. They connect us with the individual who suffered and died through one of the history's darkest periods. And they challenge us to remember and to act. As you walk through Venice, let the sparkle of this stone catch your eyes in your heart. Take a moment to pose, to read the names and to remember. In doing so, we will all become part of a collective act of remembrance that thrashes, stand and plays. The memory of those who were lost lives on each step you take, in each stone we see and the commitment to never forget. What is important is that with the stones, a new way of narrating the Shoah and persecution has been created because the stumbling blocks are, are an inclusive tool. Stones do not separate the territory or the community, but they connect with it, even with those who know little about it. Memory becomes something other than anniversary, a pin that we put on on January 27th. Thanks to this project, memory becomes something we live every day when we walk in our cities, in our street, and we enter in our homes. It is fundamental today to remember the Holocaust and the atrocities of our history. As time passes and first-hand witnesses become fewer, projects like the Stuperstein become crucial in keeping the memory alive. They serve as a reminder of the dangers of forgetting our history. These stones encourage communities to not only look back, but also to recognize the signs of rising intolerance and to act against them. Remembering the victims of the Holocaust is not just about acknowledging the past. It is also about recognizing the ongoing relevance of these events. In a world where intolerance and hatred still exist, projects like Stoperstein reminds us of the consequences of such attitudes. Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we will be talking about the Stumbling Stones initiative in Munich. Throughout the podcast I will however refer to the Stolperstein project because Stolperstein is the German word for a stumbling stone. So why Munich? Munich is a very interesting case in the context of remembrance culture and the Stolperstein project. In fact, the Stolperstein project is officially banned on municipal grounds due to a resolution from 2005 and 2015, and it is largely due to criticism from Charlotte Knoblauch, who is the president of the Jewish community of Munich and Upper Bavaria, and she argues that the stones metaphorically trample on the victims. Despite this, the Stolperstein initiative in Munich has been active since 2008. In fact, it has been very active, and so far 276 stones were installed. And this year alone, 150 Stolpersteine are scheduled for placement. Today, I had the honor of speaking with the project leader, Terry Swatsberg, who has dedicated his life to this remembrance effort. He shared insights into his work, the significance of the project for Munich, and his personal experiences dealing with the tragic histories of Nazi terror victims daily. So, before we come to the interview itself, let's first delve into the history of Jewish life in Munich, because that is essential to understand the importance of this project, especially for this city. 
history of Jews in Munich dates back to the early 13th century, and their life was marked quite immediately by pogroms, because in fact, in 1442, Jews were expelled from Upper Bavaria, including Munich, and they only resettled in the 18th century. But in 1815, the first Israelite religious community was established. And by the late 19th century, Munich's Jewish population grew to around 4,000. And with the Russian pogroms, many Eastern Jews fled to Bavaria as well. And the number in Munich rose to 12,500. However, Bavaria, particularly Munich, unfortunately was central to anti-Semitic actions. It was here where the NSDAP was founded and the infamous Bierhall Putsch of the Nazis took place. And Hitler also had his own name for the city. He called it the capital of movement. And during the Nazi rule, 10,000 people were killed in Munich due to racial, political and religious persecution, as well as sexual orientation, illnesses or perceived inappropriate behavior. 4,500 of them were Jews. And despite the near extinction during the Holocaust or the Shoah, Munich today hosts the second largest Jewish community in Germany with around 9,500 members, second only to Berlin. And the reason for that is also that a lot of Jews from former Soviet Union settled in the city. Each victim of the Nazis experienced their own Holocaust of fear, humiliation, hunger, thirst and pain. Each of these victims must be remembered individually. That's what the Stolpersteine do. They rescue the victims from mass anonymity, restoring their identities. This is a statement made by Terry Swatzberg, the head of the Stolperstein project in Munich, with whom I had the honor of conducting an interview. So let me introduce Terry Swatzberg first to you. Terry is a public affairs campaigner and he has worked for 25 years with the International Herald Tribune. He has his own public affairs firm, Swatzberg, and is known for his experiment of wearing a kippah to counter anti-Semitism. Most importantly, he is a leading figure in the Stolperstein Initiative. Since 2011, he has been the head of the project in Munich, which has been active since 2008. And during the interview, it really became clear that he has dedicated his life to the Stolperstein project. And the first time he stumbled over a stumbling stone was in Ludwigshafen in Germany. And in the interview, he talks about two feelings that he had when he saw those stones for the first time, which were gratitude and horror. Why horror? Because he just felt reminded of his own family history. Terry was born in 1953, eight years after the war, and he was born into a family that suffered many losses as a result of Nazi terror. And gratitude? Because he said the names of the victims and their fates were finally made visible. For me, sind sie die einzige Art von Holocaust Gedenken, das wirklich ähm, die wirklich was bringt und das wirklich einen Namen nennt und wirklich wir brauchen kein Metaphern, wir brauchen keinen Symbolismus, ja. wir brauchen nur die Namen der Menschen und so und deswegen liebe ich die Stolpersteine und deswegen habe ich mein Leben da zu gewidmet. Now you heard a quick snippet of the interview with Terry, in which she emphasized the importance of the Stumbling Stones movement, and Terry said that what makes this initiative so unique is that it makes the Holocaust accessible and tangible by restoring three essential elements of the victim's identity, name, fate, and place of being. And he further stresses that the stumbling stones are the only commemoration that actually truly accomplished something because it doesn't require like any kind of metaphors or symbolism. It only requires the person's name and their fate. And he, of course, also said that this does not diminish any other form of commemoration because the key is to remember in whatever way possible. As mentioned in the introduction, Munich is a special case when it comes to the Stolperstein project because due to criticism of Deming's project by Charlotte Knoblauch, she is the head of the Jewish community in Munich and also vice president of the European and World Jewish Congress, a resolution was passed in 2004 which prohibits the laying of Stolperstein on municipal ground. 
And despite crit ongoing criticism, this resolution was renewed in 2015. And Knoblauch expressed her concern, saying that, and I quote, For me, it is simply incomprehensible that people I know may be trampled underfoot again. So, as an alternative, the city suggested columns or plaques designed by Kilian Strauss and inspired by Deming's idea. And these columns or plaques, if you haven't been to Munich, um, are 186 meters high and they are like stainless steel columns which offer like a form of commemoration at eye level because each column commemorates up to 12 people and it's a combination of images and text. It's very interesting as well, so watch out if you're in Munich. But coming back to the Stolperstein initiative, the ban on municipal ground does not mean that the initiative is inactive in Munich. Quite the opposite. Since 2008, 276 stones have been laid in front of private residences and the Egyptian Museum. So both projects, the project by the city designed by Kilian Strauss and the Stumbling Stones, or Stolpersteine, exist side by side. And of course I also wanted to know from Terry how he feels or stands towards this decision. And he called it a mistake, but he can also well imagine that the decision will be called into question in the future again simply because this like memorial of the city is very complicated and costly as well. And what do the citizens of Munich think of the project? Well, Terry told me that people love it. The project is very popular and is generating a lot of interest in Munich. It's really a grassroots movement in the truest sense of the word, because public participation is crucial. So anyone can propose and fund a stone, which ensures a broad participation. And also many young people are engaged as well. This is, as Terry mentioned, because the initiative engages many young interns. So they are really like actively involved in the work of the initiative. And also many develop their own works related to the stumbling stones in forms of videos, art and theater, in which they then yeah, incorporate their own experiences. And one of the most pressing questions was, of course, also how he deals with the terrible fates of the victims that he's confronted with on a daily basis. And Terry said that these encounters, and that was in fact very surprising to hear, are increasingly affecting him. And he mentioned his vulnerability is not decreasing, but in fact it's increasing. And yet, Terry Swatsberg and all the helpers, young and old, continue to stand up for remembrance. And that is the end of this podcast episode. Thank you very much for listening. Again, it is really wonderful to see with which dedication individuals like Terry and the local community work on the Stumbling Stones or Stolperstein initiative and also now what kind of like great significance this initiative has on the whole city of Munich itself. What we said during the introduction, that we want to make you aware of the project or the initiative, um, even though you probably know those stones and you know what they stand for, really have a look if you like want to take part, because there are plenty of possibilities. For example, when it comes to cleaning the stones or also what Terry told me, he is organizing events in Munich in which like young people perform um, their experiences during their internships at the Stolperstein Initiative in forms of rap songs or feeders and yeah, many other things. So look out for stumbling stones. <laughs>